Point Blank is a crime fiction podcast. It may not be suitable for all listeners. We discuss violence in all its forms. The works we reference may include period slang, which some listeners may find offensive. The hosts also have a tendency to swear. Episode 50, Population 1280, by Jim Thompson. And welcome, everybody. It is episode 50, five zero of Point Blank. I didn't even know that we would make it this Woo! far, but my name is Kurt. Yes, and wooing in the background, it's Justin. How are you doing, Justin? It's good. We don't even hate each other yet, so um, I think that's a hallmark of a, a good uh, host relationship. Well, Justin, you never know. I might be plotting against you. Well, if you are, it's it's a long game because uh, I I don't I don't feel the suspense yet. No. Well, yes, it's it's going to be for the big payoff at the end. But anyway, I still have a long long way to go. Maybe in about fifty years, I'll 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 stalk okay, you. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll be waiting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it, it is episode 50 and um, boy, it, it it does feel good to say that number and know that we have uh, made it this far. Yeah. Yeah. It's been what? Three, three plus years. Yeah. I mean, to get there. We started, in, um, we started the discussions in March of 2017. I remember it very clearly because I was on spring break and uh, we were, uh, you, you broached the subject to me and, and I was like, I said, why not? And all of a sudden, we began our planning instantly. We were trying to imagine what it might look like and what our first episodes were, would be. And, and I remember the, the feeling I had, the excitement of a new project and, and you know, the unknown uh, possibilities. And here we are. Well, you know, it's it's three and a half years since since then. And I, I'm very much still into it and very excited about the stuff we're doing. So thanks for uh, bringing me into the fold and, and uh, suggesting this idea. I, I think it's been you know, uh, a success so far. Yeah, I would think so. And, you know, it, it was it was one of those ideas that as soon as it popped in my head, you were the first person that I would have even conceived of doing this project with. And it everything just sort of made sense. Yeah. And I think that, that that's a good sign of, a, of something that's, that's worth doing. You know, it's just, it all like, yeah, there's been a lot of hurdles and it is a challenge. And, you know, we don't have the release schedule that a lot of shows have because we have other things going on, but not that other people don't, but, you know, we have a lot of things that make it difficult to record on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, but we get, we get through that and, um, and here we are. And I think we've, I think we've done a pretty good job. I think we've brought something to the table, uh, that's a little different than the other shows that are out there. And, and I think that's been received pretty well from, from, uh, the fans of crime fiction. So I, I'm very happy uh, with what we've been able to do. I agree. I, I, we never claim to um, be anything that we're not. We we were very clear in, in our our preface in episode one about who we are and how we're approaching the genre. And I, I feel like we've stayed true to our mission and to our, ourselves. And I've never felt that uh, we've run into problems related to our interest in crime fiction or our direction for the show. Like you said, really, it's, it's just been an issue of scheduling that, that has been our, our biggest enemy. And that's something that we can work around. And, um, and here we are uh, returning back to the beginning with Jim Thompson, who uh, is one of our favorite authors. Uh, we, we've said it many times. And this is one of his, uh, well, best known and arguably finest works. But we'll, of course, get into that with our new format as we discuss discuss population 1280 in its entirely in this singular episode. Yeah, and I think that this makes a lot of sense to circle back around to Jim, Jim Thompson because I you know, I th- as you said, we both really enjoy his work and I think he's the type of crime fiction author that really gets us both excited about this genre. Um I know he's not for everybody, but he's definitely he's definitely one of my favorites if not my my favorite crime fiction author and everything of his is not perfect. Um, and we, maybe we'll get into that today, but when you look at the scope of, of Thompson's writing, what he did for the genre and how other authors have responded to his work, uh, I think, uh, I think it's, you know, he deserves a second episode for sure. Yeah, definitely. And I, I'm, I look forward to reading this book for a long time. Here we are. Uh, we're not going to do everything, uh, in the old way or the traditional way, because we've already spent a lot of time talking about 
Jim in episode one. We gave a thorough biography and, um, you know, we got to understand who he was as a, as a man in the world. And his life r- really was interesting. He grew up and came of age in, a, in an interesting time in American history. Born in 1906, lived through the Great Depression, was friends with Woody Guth- Guthrie, was involved in communist and labor, labor movements and worked the oil wells as a as an oil worker, roughneck, and in, in during the depression, and then you know found his fame in writing, um, and um, even worked with Stanley Kubrick. Like he he captures a nice little slice of a American like literary and, and artistic history, which which I would never have known had had we not uh, started this podcast. Yeah, and I think it's interesting too that um, you know he, he just had a birthday, uh, September twenty seventh. He would have been what one hundred and three, one hundred and four years old. And I, you know, there was a very nice uh, article or, or several articles actually about Thompson's work and how it's still so relevant to our world today. And um, you know, it's it it speaks volumes that uh, he still has some some very relevant things to say in our society. It's it's just it's great to see that his popularity. While he did not get recognized that much during his life, uh, that his legacy lives on and and people are still talking about him. So we're going to do that today by looking at this Population 1280. And it's also really, it's not just revisiting Jim Thompson that we're doing today. We're also revisiting a theme that is, is somewhat common in Thompson's writing, where we have a corrupt sheriff. And that's exactly of what we had in The Killer Inside Me. So it's really going to be interesting, I think, to see a book that was in the killer inside me, we covered in, in episode one was towards the, not one of his earliest books, but one of his earliest books in his, in the period that's sort of his golden years of production. Yeah. And this one is kind of on the tail end of that. Uh, this one came out in 1964. Yeah. Um, so it's, so it's a little later. So we can see how that, that theme that he, he certainly came back to uh, developed over time and, and what he did with that. Totally. Do you want to give us a summary of this book, John? Yeah, I have a fairly thorough um, summary that I, I'll, I'll introduce here, and then um, and then we'll we'll move ahead into our, our deep dive uh, about about this book. So this, as you mentioned, Kurt, this was published in 1964, Population 1280, and it's 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 widely considered his last major work. But also, it a lot of folks have considered it a essentially a revision or a rewrite of the killer inside me. It's the same themes, the same setting, and uh, the same kind of corrupt sheriff who has something to hide. And while it is different, and we'll talk about that, um, I think the reason why this is such an important theme in Jim Thompson's life is something that was alluded to way back in episode one. And it's Jim's relationship with his father, who was a difficult man. Um, and I think that this, based on what I've read, um, this this character that he struggles with, this 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 corrupt uh, authority figure, is him is him contending with his father. And, and obviously, with all of our motifs as writers, uh, we tend to recur, return to the same things that, that, that haunt us over and over again. So... Uh, that's what's happening here. And, you know, is it a major work? Is it a work worthy of our time and attention? I'll start off by saying I think so. But let me tell you a bit about um, what what happens in this story, uh, including some spoilers, but I won't give away the entirety of the ending. We are introduced to protagonist Nick Corey uh, in the first chapter. He's the sheriff of Pitts County, and he presents himself as a bit of a numbskull, which is in, in line with the Lou Ford character from from The Killer. Uh, he lets people take advantage of his goodwill and his general niceness. He has a wife that accuses him uh, early on uh, of raping her. Um, he denies this. Obviously, their their relationship is is full of tension and and acrimony, and it's just it's not a good not a good situation. Uh, he seems he comes across as a sucker and a do nothing. Uh, and they live on the second floor of the courthouse in this small town. In the first chapter, he, he alludes to some trouble, and we journey with him on a train to visit another sheriff two counties away. His name is Ken Lacey, and he's like a, an elder sheriff who can convey uh, advice. Nick uh, points to his trouble and conflict, and, and Lacey helps him out with some advice about acting tough and being hard and whatever. And um, this is just one of the many early on tensions, moments of, of potential conflict that we are given by Thompson. Other things that he sets up for us that we see very clearly in the first few chapters is that um, there are two pimps in, in Pitts County that are that have been giving 
our main character trouble and they've been disrespecting him, abusing him, and he takes it because he's been a bit of a pushover. So uh, he implies that he's not going to let them get away with it for longer. Two is that his his wife has a mentally handicapped brother, Lenny, who is a notorious peeping Tom in town um, and has even peeped in on one of Nick's ex-flames. This is obviously potentially going to lead, lead to trouble. And then the third thing is that Nick is having a very obvious affair with a woman named Rose, who is best friends to his wife. His wife does not suspect anything. Uh, Rose is, well, she's an interesting character. And any one of these, you know, four things is going to lead to trouble. But uh, naturally, given the kind of story it is, they all are going to come back and and affect us and affect our our main character. So Nick comes back from his visit with, with Sheriff Lacey and immediately goes and kills the two pimps that were giving him trouble. So now we're in it. Lacey comes to town the next morning, perhaps rethinking some of the thoughts he had, uh, the things he said to Nick. He thought maybe maybe he wants to catch him before he does something audacious. And it turns out that we learn about a, a lot about Nick in the scene because Nick, Nick ends up spinning reality by gaslighting Ken Lacey into thinking um, that he, in fact, was the murderer of these two pimps, that it was his doing. Uh, it was a, a, an interesting bit of manipulation that uh, really helps us to see uh, the kind of character we're dealing with. And then, now that he's broken the ice on, on murder, uh, realizing its power, Nick starts, goes on a bit of a spree. He uh, kills Rose's drunk asshole husband, Tom, and, and uh, leaves him to die in a forest. This is a, a the same Tom that was seen the day before, uh, assaulting and, and abusing a, a black man in the town in a racially charged scene. It turns out that a couple days later, Tom reappears, the, presumably dead. He re- reappears on Rose's front porch, and she screams. Um, Nick's in the house at the time, and he has a gaping hole in his abdomen. Clearly, he's dead, but uh, somebody brought him to the house. And who did that? It turns out Nick races after a horse carriage and stops it. It's Uncle John, the man who was abused uh, in the street, and... What happens here is that Nick invites John to help him deal with Tom, like explains, sort of rationalizes the reasonings for what happened. And then, uh, of course, uh, he can't have any witnesses, so he kills John as well. So the bodies start to pile up. Um, Meanwhile, Nick is creating this triangle romance with himself and and Rose, and also this other woman, Amy, who is um, the ex-fiancé or the ex-flame, uh, Rose is the best friend of, of Myra, the wife. She's an interesting character. Uh, we're going to, I think, have some conversations about her. She's like a two-faced firebrand. Uh, she feigns to uh, to Myra like she is the kindest or most moral person in the world. But behind the scenes, she's, she's, she's venomous and duplicitous. She regularly calls on Nick to visit her. He obliges. I mean, he's terrible. This is a book of a story full of terrible people, which is, um, you know, Thompson's M.O., it's a confused web of deceit, and this becomes more imp- uh, apparent when he visits Amy, having already dispatched Rose's husband and sort of set the stage for him to go off with Rose. He can't, uh, you know, the grass is always greener with, with Nick Corey. So he visits on Amy uh, and uh, sort of, you know, persuades her to have a relationship. And then in an interesting scene after they have sex, uh, he's supposed to go visit Rose. So he's he's double, you know, double two-timing his wife on the same night. Um, but because he just had sex, he's, he's not really, you know, he doesn't, he's not um, able to uh, re- revisit sexual relations with Rose. So he pretends that he's kicked in the groin by a horse. So Rose sort of caretakes him and realizes, you know, helps him and, and doesn't expect, you know, uh, intimacy. It's just pretty funny. It sort of captures Nick Corey at his basest. But um, he does all this while maintaining this hold on power. I mean, he's a cop. He's the, he's the sheriff in town. Uh, people mock him. Um, he's running for re-election, but like, you know, there's there's this whole plot arc about whether or not he's uh, fit for the job. And um, most people believe he's, he's an unaccomplished simpleton. And in this way, like I said, this is like Lou Ford. They're both outwardly simple and easygoing and sort of benevolent. They're like friendly guys, but their mask hides something malevolent and vile. Uh, but they're not the same. And we'll talk about that, too. Um, in my final thoughts here, I feel like the story is a real, a real good, tight, tangled web. And Jim Thompson does a good job of bringing in all the players from page one on the, on the way through 
to contribute to the impossible situation that Nick Corey not only creates, but magnifies with his self-absorbed and irrational thinking. He becomes like this master of his own domain. He, I think he, he gets delusions of grandeur about all the things he can do once the killing starts. Um, for example, he framed the old sheriff uh, from the first scene. But then there's also this other sub-sheriff or deputy named Buck, the old deputy that the sheriff mocks, the one that Nick promises, uh, makes some promises to. They both uh, have a thing against Ken Lacey. But we, we lose Buck for a while. He's not really in the story. But he makes his return toward the end in a, in a way that I thought was interesting couple other things. Here's a smoking gun. We have all these murders and Nick's just rolling along thinking he's getting away with it, everything. But something from the past, the train, he takes the train to visit Ken Lacey. Well, it turns out somebody was on that train, somebody that was very integral to the story. Amy, the woman he is two-timing doubly so, um, the one that uh, is who he now is uh, intending to put his life you know, um, on the line for, the one he wants to be with at least uh, this day. Uh, it turns out that she uh, was on the train. She saw him, you know, off the pimps, and now she's holding this over his head. So with Amy forcing him to lay off, she's like, she's like you can't go hang out with, with, um, with what's-her-name, and with Rose, and he, and he has to stop. You know, he has to, he has to be on his best behavior. So he concocts a whole new scheme involving Rose and his wife, Myra, and, and Lenny, to try to um, you know clear the clear the path for him to pursue his life with Amy, and this leads to a, a sort of a climactic moment uh, where some shit goes down, which I won't talk about right now. But it's it's classic scheming and gaslighting by an unreliable narr- narrator, uh, and you know do things go well for Nick? Do things turn out? Um, I'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, my final thoughts are that this book is as good as the killer inside me. Uh, I'm going to flip a coin as to which one I preferred at this point. Uh, the protagonist, if you want to call him that, is irresistible in his wickedness. I hate him, and I wish him only harm, but I love to see how he schemes his way in and out of the hearts and minds of the people of Potts County. I would give this 4.5 hits, and I would also ask you, Kurt, who is the bigger monster, Lou Ford or Nick Corey? I think that would be a good question for us to explore. Mm, Justin, that's a good question. Oh, boy. Well, let me first of all say that I really enjoyed this book. Um, I think it is, you know, it's classic Thompson. However, I'm going to I'm gonna pick a side on, on The Killer Inside Me in this book. And I think The Killer Inside to me is just a little bit better than this one. Just a touch. And I think the reason for that is that I like Jim Thompson when, for me, when he's, he's at his best is when he's in his most raw form. And the less polished... In a way, I mean, it's still an excellent book. In the less polished version, in my mind, in The Killer Inside Me, the rawness of the story comes out a little bit more. So for me, that's the, that's probably, I'm going to, I guess I'm going to say Lou Ford. And I'm going to slightly say that for me, The Killer Inside Me uh, stays at pretty much a five star book where this one is like a 4.5 for me as well. So I'm not going to disagree with your rating at all, uh, but I am going to make a, I'm going to make a clear distinction between the two books. There's a lot of things I love in this. And if we didn't have the killer inside me to compare it to, uh, it would, there wouldn't be any need to, to have that discussion, but it would still be a, a solid, solid book. I see what you're saying. And given, given my hit count 4.5, I, I gave, I gave the killer inside me five. So that could be me just having, you know, shifting in the way that I evaluate books. But I, I, I could see and, and, and buy an argument that, that claims that the killer is just a little bit better, maybe because of the rawness argument that you bring up, but also because it's the, it's the same setup, but it's the first one. And you know what? A New Hope, I'm going to even, you know, with all of its flaws, Star Wars A New Hope is going to be better than A Force Awakens, even though it uses the same formula. <laughs> For one, it's inherently a better film, but you know, you know, getting the do over it loses a little something in 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 the remaking. So, they they both are good standalone works, and they both offer something that few uh, noir and crime fiction writers offer as well. But um, Lou Ford versus Nick Corey, uh, Lou Ford was absolutely haunting. Uh, with Nick Corey, we get Lou Ford again, and is. He's also great, but we've seen him before in a certain sense. So perhaps a little bit of, of the newness, um, the uh, you know, is, is we lose that. 
But we're going to get into a deeper dive on this uh, this book in just a few minutes. But um, before we do that, we want to share with you a, a new podcast that reached out to us and wanted us to talk about it a little bit. Dirt Cheap. It's a new podcast from Neon Hum Media. It digs deep into the dollar bins of used bookstores in your grandmother's storage unit in search of pulp, sass, and questionable grammar. It's the poolside podcast you've been waiting for. Well, I don't know about the poolside, but I can see how our listeners uh, would enjoy um, books uh, from this period. It's going to be guided by uh, hosts Amanda Meadows and Jeffrey Golden. And each season, uh, they'll explore a forgotten and discarded pulp novel called from the dustbin of literary history, reenacting its pages through narration and sound design, stopping and starting to respond and bring its oddity and hilarity occasionally into relief. That actually sounds like a pretty cool structure. Amanda and Jeffrey uh, bring these rare, bizarre stories to life each week, chapter by chapter, with a heavy dose of humor and dash of, of shade and Freud. Yeah, in this first season, they're going to be covering the book Murder in the Glass Room. It's an L.A. noir novel that almost became a blockbuster film. Set in Los Angeles in the 1940s, it's a funny, surprising, and very dated tale about a murder starring a, a, a bookie named Phil who's obsessed with following that murder and is also really into interior design. He's really odd and does odd things. For for example, when he enters a room, he always describes the furniture in it. Well, that's that's kind of common in, in Pulp Fiction anyway. And Phil is supposedly a detective, not a real detective, but starts to act like one when his wife is murdered and he's the primary suspect. Certainly a trope we've seen in uh, crime fiction before. Of course, and you don't need to read the full book to listen. Host Amanda and Jeffrey will guide you chapter by chapter, extracting excerpts and providing their own comedic commentary in storytelling style. So we recommend, uh, give it a shot. Join Amanda and Jeffrey in the efforts to solve this mystery together and have some fun along the way. Uh, this podcast is, is brand new. We don't know too much about it, but we're excited about um, the promise of it. Uh, and it'll be a nice way to spend uh, our continued time uh, in the pandemic uh, laughing while also uh, being entertained by by old school pulp mysteries. Yeah, that's right. And it's it, the name of it again is Dirt Cheap. I'm sure you can find it on your favorite uh, podcast uh, catcher or Apple Podcasts. It's supposed to come out October 15th, 2020. And Justin, I did pick up a copy of this book just because I was interested. And, you know, it's there's no reprint of this particular one, but it, it does look like you're classic sort of silly, you know, and let's be honest here, folks, a lot of this pulp crime fiction does have some silly elements to it. I think they're going to be bringing out the humor in it. I did want to mention that the the authors are kind of interesting uh, of the, it's Murder in the Glass Room. Uh, it's written by two people, Edwin Rolf and Lester Fuller. Uh, Lester Fuller was a uh, Hollywood director, um, nothing super remarkable. And this was supposed to be, I guess, a uh, you know, a possible movie that they were going to do. And Edwin uh, Rolf is uh, interesting. He is, uh, was a, a socialist, a writer, a poet. Uh, he served yet another pulp fiction author who served in the Spanish civil war in the Abraham Lincoln brigades. And um, he wrote uh, some other things about uh, this, about that war and also McCarthyism, uh, which we've seen affect uh, our pulp fiction authors, including Jim Thompson. So, uh -huh. It all comes back to Jim. That's right. That's right. It all comes back to Jim Thompson, uh, that lovable weirdo. R.I.P., buddy. All right. So um, while we're talking other podcasts, I thought I'd throw one other one out there that I just listened to, um, and that is uh, The Old Gods of Appalachia. And I know it's not a crime fiction thing, but if you were interested in that review, we did a Cole Black and sort of some of the, I guess, horror mystery of, the, of Appalachia. I think you'd you'd find this podcast pretty good. It touches on a lot of uh, a lot of history, the coal mine wars, uh, st you know, settlement of the area, stuff like that. Um, I've been listening to it and it's very enjoyable. Highly recommend uh, the Old Gods of Appalachia. That sounds good. I have a feeling I'm going to be listening to more podcasts as the weather starts to turn and we move toward winter. Uh, there's only so many things to do when you're 
in a partial pandemic. And uh, I like to go places and I can't. So podcasts are one of those ways that I, I get to go on, on a little journey. That's for sure. Uh, moving back to our population 1280, we're going to get into the meat of this one. And, um, you know, as usual, uh, we like to start with the characters, but, uh, I thought maybe this time around we could start just a little bit with the relevance of, of Jim Thompson in our, in our day and age and just sort of set the tone. Would that be all right with you, Justin? That sounds about right to me. All right. So in, in my copy of uh, Population 1280, the introduction is uh, written by uh, Daniel Woodrow, which came up in our, our last episode um, about Rule Noir. And he says, Thompson attacks just about all of the big ogres of American existence, poverty, racism, labor, social hypocrisy in general, and the re relaxed enforcement of laws for those who have amassed gold the brutal enforcement for those who haven't. And I think that, you know, I think that sort of comes through certainly in this particular book. Totally. Yeah. That was one quote from the beginning that I think, you know, sort of sets the tone of, of looking at Thompson's body of work. And then there is another quote here. Uh, and this is in, in this is when I was saying that Jim Thompson is still relevant. Uh, this is from the crime reads article, uh, that just came out, um, and its title is Jim Thompson is the cynical voice of reason we need in this dumpster fire of a mm -hmm. year. Uh, that, that dumpster fire, of course, being 2020. And, um, they, they, the subtitle of this particular is a quote from him that says life is a bucket of shit with a barbed wire handle Yeah, <laughs> that speaks Very to visceral. Yeah. And Thompson's, uh, nihilistic version of, uh, or view of the world, I should say. Yeah, there was there was no wool pulled over his eyes. He didn't see the world with rose color tinted glasses. He was very much a, a a realist about about the 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 dire conditions and straits that we all exist within, and uh, we see that translated in pretty much all of his work. Uh, but especially in this his very his very very cynical view of of authority figures. And and here's a this is an extended quote from Population 1280, but. Uh, I think it's also very relevant to our times. I'm going to read it uh, here. People looking for easy answers to big problems. People that can't realize that a heck of a lot of things are bound to go wrong in a world as big as this one. And if there is any answer to why it's that way, and there ain't always, why it's probably j not just one answer by itself, but thousands of answers. But that's the way my daddy was, like these people. They buy some books by a fella that don't know a goddamn thing more than they do, or he went to having to write books, and that's supposed to set them straight about everything. Or they buy themselves a bottle of pills, or they say the whole trouble is with other folks, and the only thing to do is get rid of them. Or they claim we got to war with another country. End quote. That's from Population 1280. Yeah. So, there's a lot of things, uh, is, is, is you know, the general point here that uh, Jim Thompson observed in his writing. And uh, it's why it's, you know, it's, it sticks with us is because these are, are un well, I guess, unfortunately, truisms of the 20th and 21st century, for sure. Yep, yep, absolutely. I want to add one more quote from, a, from an author named David Cochran, who wrote uh, American Noir Underground Writers and Filmmakers of the Post-War Era. And he talks about um, Thompson's universe. Um, in Thompson's universe, in, in, in the books that he's written, most characters are performers wearing masks that allow them to fit in while covering their darker manipulative sides. For, from Lou Ford and The Killer Inside Me and, and to uh, Nick Corey in Population 1280, the outward image of boring, old, good old boy covers their inner homicidal Machiavellian genius. And um, we're going to spend some time discussing this. I frankly haven't read too many um, of of Thompson's books that weren't involving the sheriffs. Um, but I know that you've read a couple more th than, than I, Kurt. Do you feel like he plays with this notion of masks and, you know, in, in, in the stories that aren't related to the police? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head, but it does certainly seem that that's, you know, that's one of his common themes is that people often, you know, just this idea that people have one face in public uh, and there's something else uh, when they take that mask off. Uh, I think that's that's a very, very common Thompson theme and getting at what is really lying underneath yeah. 
is is something we see reoccurring in his fiction. And which is a classic, uh, you know, move in, in 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 noir writing in general is that things aren't as they seem. The dark underbelly is revealed. Um, you know, that's that's sort of he captures personifies in his characters. Uh, you know, a lot of the 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 trappings or tropes of, of noir fiction. Um, and Nick Corey, uh, like we said, is similar to Lou Ford from The Killer Inside Me, but he's not he's not the same. Um, you want to maybe talk a no. little bit about Nick Corey, what what makes him tick, um, why how how he's different from Lou, and and you know just sort of riff on him a bit. Sure, I mean we I mean he's obviously the main character of this book. He's the Potts County uh, High Sheriff, I believe they call him. He's definitely a different kind of sheriff because he said, talks about his his job is. I minded my own business and I didn't arrest no one unless I just couldn't get out of it. Yes. <laughs> and they didn't amount to nothing. So he's kind of saying that his job is, you know, his sheriff is to do as little as possible. Yeah. His job is to avoid being sheriff. Like, and his hopes in getting elected yeah. is that if he, if he bothers nobody and offends nobody, then he'll just continue on uh, easy street, getting his paycheck and, and living his, his sad little life. Uh, it's, it's sort of amusing is his approach to, to the job. Yeah. And it it definitely speaks to Thompson's like view of sort of elected officials as well, because he kind of, um, there's a, you know, there's a number of, of, of characters who interact with him who say something to the, you know, basically say that because he's doing nothing, he's doing a great job. Corey is a, is a difficult character because, you know, I think compared to say Lou Ford, Lou Ford has a, a lot of uh, character traits that, as the observer, even within the story, you might say, "Well, wait a minute, there's not qu- there's something not quite right about this guy." Whereas with Corey, it certainly comes across as a lot more innocent of an individual, and even though you know something is going to happen with Corey, the first time that it happens when he kills the two. Uh, pimps, bouncers, uh, moose and curly. It's kind of a shock in the book. You're like, Oh, wait a minute. Did I just read that right? And you know, he doesn't, uh, he very casually goes about his, uh, his murders, uh, in this book. The thing that Thompson, I think does well with these characters of, in a lot of his characters, not just Lou Ford in, in, um, in Nick Corey is that, um, you have to sit there and wonder like exactly how much did he plan on, on this ahead of time? And I think that's one of the things that he does very well in this in this novel with the character of Corey is that even towards the end of the book, you're still want, sort of wondering, well, how much of this did did Nick plan on his own and how much of this sort of just fell into his lap? Yeah. I personally, I kind of come away with the fact that this was a plan like this was his he had him. He's actually the master manipulator here. I would agree with that. I think with, with Lou Ford, Lou Ford was all Mr. Yokel to the to the populace, but to us, to the reader, he was revealing his cards constantly. He kept, you know, he, he would orate and he would uh, speak about his 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 skill set and calculus and in like more advanced education. He was constantly showing us that he was not the fool that uh, people in his community perceived him to be. Uh, with with Nick, he doesn't even include us. He's duping us at the same time as he's duping the town. We only get hints and wisps of his of his hidden hand, but he doesn't just come out and st- give it to us early on like like Lou did. And that made it, it definitely made him harder to read, and it made him more unsettling because we weren't we weren't part of we weren't insiders. We just had to wait and see what the hell he did. And as the as the body started to pile. Um, and as things got more twisted and complicated and he, and we started to see that he was really, you know, mapping things out, uh, it became clear just through observation that, yeah, he definitely appeared to have a grand vision throughout the whole thing. The question is when, when did it start? It might've started when he got on the train to go visit Sheriff Lacey right at the beginning because that he, he roped him in right away. I don't think he did that off the cuff. I think it even goes back further than that. I, to me, in my reading of this, and this maybe is getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves, but his marriage to Myra, like I kind of, I, the way I read it, I kind of feel like he knew he was getting duped in that situation and he had already formed a plan to turn that to his advantage. I certainly wouldn't be surprised. I, I could totally buy that reading because there's never at, at any point a, a sense that that marriage was anything other than uh, a shit show that was born on false pretenses. And, you know, I think they, 
he had gotten her pregnant and it was a, it was a, a marriage by necessity. Um, and the weird, the weird brother thing, you know, the, the brother who is perhaps mentally ill and in need of help, but is he the brother or not? Was this some kind of faking scheme? Like that whole thing was very, very strange. And I would be given what we know about Nick's intelligence uh, I'd be surprised to find that he fell into that accidentally and didn't have that part of his Machiavellian genius to quote, to quote Cochran. You know, that genius, it's, it's very interesting as the reader to see how he does this stuff because he, and again, this is my, there's a lot here left to the reader's interpretation, but my reading of this is that he sort of knows what he wants to do or does know what he wants to do. Then he goes to somebody else and sort of manipulates the conversation. So then it's their idea. And then he turns around and does what he was going to do anyway. But now he has this like buffer of, well, that was your idea. That wasn't my idea. Oh, it's just, it, yeah. He's the ultimate online troll. He just manipulating you, putting words in people's mouths and then blaming you for, for thoughts that, that he planted in your head. Uh, it, it's, it's very infuriating. Like I read him and it, it feels like reading the comment section, uh, in your favorite online magazine. <laughs> and it's like, I, I fucking yeah. hate you. Uh, but man, it's so fun to ride, ride this train with, with his cleverness. Cause I, I keep, I keep wanting him to get, get busted and you know, he, he, it, things don't work out as you'd, ex, you know, it's not going to be a happy ending for everybody. Um, uh, but, uh, man, he's, he's a challenging, uh, you know, unreliable narrator who I can't wait to see get his get his due, you know? Yeah, and I think we should maybe point out that, you know, early on in the book, one of the things that illustrates this is that he lives in the in the second floor of the courthouse. And there is a public outhouse. That's the kind of time frame we're in here. There's a public outhouse on the courthouse grounds that will smell up his apartment, right? So he knows he's got to do something about this. And I'm sure that he, he has some ideas. But he goes and, and talks to his friend, um, Ken, uh, you know, asks him for advice as to what to do. And I think, again, my reading of this is that he's setting Ken up, that Ken tells him things and then he does them. And then so Ken is sort of thinking that he's the one manipulating Nick. Well, anyway, Ken suggests that what he should do is... Uh, maybe loosen up the nails in the outhouse. And the reason for that is in the, every morning, a prominent bank, the prominent banker in town, there's only one comes to use this outhouse on the way to the bank. Well, in the dead of night, Nick goes out there and he loosens up the nails. And in the morning, the banker comes to s sit on the outhouse and lo and behold, all the planks fall and he falls into a pile of shit that is uh you know, 30 years in the making, according to Nick, in which case this infuriates the banker, manipulates the town council. Lo and behold, by the end of the day, the outhouse has been removed. The soil is filled in and Nick doesn't have to deal with the smell of the outhouse any longer. Hey, direct action gets the goods. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we're given this rather, you know, normal or perhaps reasonable uh, manipulation here to start the show. Uh, and then it just goes deeper and deeper from there um, as the story progresses. And I'm not really sure, Justin, is there a major character in this book that by the end of the book, Nick has not manipulated? Um, I mean, no, I mean, at the start, he manipulates the sheriff and in Buck, Buck, you know, they, they have a little thing going on early on with him and Buck and Buck re re recurs at the end. And and I'll just say it. Nick Nick's already playing and manipulating him at the end. So Myra, I mean, Myra thinks he's an th thinks he's an idiot and a loser. So she's duped. He sets up Lenny. Uh, he manipulates Rose. Uh, Amy. Oh, yeah. He totally manipulates Amy. He lies to Uncle John, uh, help, seeks his help and then kills him. I think he's he scams everybody. He lives the absolute lie in Pitts County. Yeah, there's I don't I can't think of a single soul. Yeah, and uh, no, I I really can't either because it seems like everybody is under some level of his manipulation. And I mean, the fact that even that he can pull off uh, sleeping with essentially three different women in the same small town is uh, is rather remarkable. Yeah. But uh, he does that. Yeah, yeah. He's he has, he has a lot of confidence in his abilities and. They tend to uh, serve him. Uh, we don't know much about uh, his life prior to this. He, he's he's put on this act for a long enough time to maintain his position for a while now. 
and uh, but but we don't get too much backstory. We get a little backstory about him and Myra coming together, and him and Amy's background. But um, really, we're we're here in the present moment with him going forward as he decides to uh, add killing into his repertoire. Uh, we don't get a sense that this is something he's been doing regularly in the past. This is just now. In terms of the, we have several women in this in this story. Uh, Myra, his wife, who hates him. <laughs> Rose who hates Myra and uses him as a weapon against her in a way. And, and Amy, who is like the kind, like the sort of like the neutral one who reveals that she has something against him that she can use as a weapon. So everybody's sort of scheming a little bit against the other. But of these three uh, characters, is there one that stood out to you as being more interesting or, or more complicated than the rest? At the end of the day, it's probably Myra, just because of the extended backstory we get and how she set up um, Nick uh, for for marriage, that she basically, they meet at a carnival, and she invites him back to her room, and um, then they they have sex, and she makes a fuss, and then the neighbors come running in, and then she tries to claim that, uh, or she claims that he ra- raped her, and then... He says something, basically she forces him into marrying him. Um, he's either going to get strung up and hung or or have to marry her. Well, she's trying to, uh, to get, uh, I don't know what she, exactly she thought she was getting in Nick, but it was clear that she didn't get what she was after. It uh, turns out that Myra and, and Lenny um, in the past have also done things like uh, taken pictures of people in compromising positions and blackmailed them and, and stuff like that. So Myra has, has something of a history herself. Yeah. So, I mean, she she's kind of the most interesting in that regard. Both her and, and Rose ultimately are pretty horrible people themselves. Yeah. So ultimately, you don't really feel a lot of sympathy for either of those characters. Amy is sort of the odd duck for me because the the, one of the problems, you know, she's sort of the moral character in this, but I'm never really sold on this uh, or not convinced, I guess I should say, as to why Nick and her were supposed to get married just before Nick married Myra, like, you know, in the same week or something. But I'm never really sold on why that was supposed to happen or or what. Uh, I'm not. Do you remember why? Um, no, I'm I'm not entirely clear. I don't recall with specificity what what caused that, other than other than Myra's scheming. I'm not sure if it's convenient or if it's just something that you know that Jim didn't give us everything we we needed there. But um, yeah, I just. I guess I'm just not quite sold on the relationship between Amy and Nick. And not that it takes away from the story that much. That's fine. But there there did seem to be a little bit of something lacking from her, uh, either her story or her emotion uh, as regards to Nick. But yeah, um, all, all three good, good characters, um, not likable characters necessarily, but good characters. No, they all served a, a plot function, but they but they were also characters in their own right enough so that it didn't feel as if. I mean, I think Amy, of all of them, serves the biggest plot function in, in terms of well, she gets pl- all of a sudden it's Amy that he's after, and we we try to figure out why Amy matters, and it turns out Amy was on the on the train, so she can use that as a weapon against him, and that tightens the, you know the vice even further uh, halfway through the novel. But uh, had she been a little flimsier, it would ju- it would have felt a little bit like uh, a plant by Jim just to just to help his plot along. But because he handled her well enough, uh, it it add, it's like the third or fourth or fifth thing that 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 ratchets up the tension in this novel in a way that it just keeps getting worse and worse um, for Nick, and he he just keeps getting deeper and deeper in the mire of his own duplicity and and, and manipulate, manipulation, um, and it's just fun to watch. How how is he going to get out of this now? Um, and I would say that I wouldn't call Amy my favorite character. I, I would say it would probably be Rose because of her, her two-facedness and how she ultimately is okay. used at the end um, to, like, she thinks that she's getting back at, at Myra, and it turns out that she she's being master manipulated the whole time by Nick, and she, she serves a convenient, you know, um, plot role at the end when she has to confront Myra and Lenny uh, over, you know, all of, all of Nick's machinations to get them over there 
to have their confront confrontation. Uh, should we talk about the confrontation? I'm trying not to like say stuff about the end. Yeah, we could avoid that, I think. Um, but there is a good confrontation. I think we can say that, and that's wor- well worth uh, reading for. Yeah, things come to a head, as you would expect in a novel like this. There is one more element of manipulation that I think is worth mentioning, and that's the uh, the election campaign. Yeah, he's running against um, Sam Gaddis, I, th- I believe the name is, who's who's his opponent. And this is yet another example of how Nick manipulates a situation, because uh, there's a lot of rumors that Nick might actually get uh, voted out of office. But uh, Nick starts some rather unpleasant rumors about. Oh uh, yeah, yeah about Sam. Yeah, that I forgot like it's a B plot, like it's not it's not the primary, so I, I yeah. forgot, but yeah, he he creates a whole conspiracy against Sam through some cleverly dropped like nothings. He just manufactures lies. I mean, it, it's a great for an election season like like we're in now. Sure. Yeah. He plants the seeds of of distrust in the community and, and lets the rest of the community carry it forward and turn it into a thing that the that haunts uh and, and ruins uh, his this candidate's election chances. Yeah, I mean this this uh, type of election manipulation could easily be extended to uh, what happens online today with elections. But yeah, Nick starts this unfounded rumor um, about uh, his opponent like uh, sexually assaulting children, and um, th- then he he sp- spreads it. People start talking about it. And then he does the wonderful thing of standing up for his opponent yes. and says, oh, there's no way that these stories could be true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, committing the the, the fallacy um, that we see nowadays, uh, Trump uses this all the time, saying, well, we certainly will not talk about the thing that and then says the thing that's bad because we're, we're, we're better than that. We're not going to say the thing that he, he molests children because why would why would we do that? So you're saying it, not saying it. Yeah. And, and he does this over and over again uh, in a way that's just, it's so insidious and it's so terrifying to watch because you know how it snowballs. Um, it, it's just, I guess, politically, because of where we are right now, it's, 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 it's horrifying to see how that happens and how effective it can be. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, do we, do we have anything else to cover with the characters here, Justin? No, I think we cover the gist of it. I don't really have much to say about Buck. I think the characters that matter to me, we, we've discussed, and I'd like to at least talk a little bit about our thoughts about, um, you know, any other aspects of this book or, or Thompson's craft uh, or the historical context. I mean, because, you know, this, is, this was his last major work. What, do you have any thoughts on, on setting, plot, any of that stuff? As far as setting goes, I mean, I think it, it's fitting that, as as you say, this was his last major work, that he revisits that uh, East Texas landscape. And that's one that we've certainly seen him cover before. It's one he knows intimately, both as a writer and personally. So, you know, there's and any and as you say, said earlier, recovering or re- revisiting that theme of a sheriff and how that connects to his father. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty significant in this, in this body of work. Thompson's, I think at his best when he's in rural America. Yeah. Small town America. I think that's that his, of his fiction I've read, that's where it hits home the best because it's, it's what he knows the best. Yeah. 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 That goes back to his heart. I mean, he was born in Oklahoma. He spent a lot of time in Texas and, that's where his coming of age was. That's where he, he learned uh, what he liked and what he didn't like. And he learned uh, uh, things that would stick with him for the rest of his life, including uh, betrayal and, you know, realizations about his family that he, uh, that he struggled with. And uh, I, I think returning to the scene of the crimes of, of our past and the things that most haunt us is one of the keys to really digging into and understanding ourselves. And, and, it, and it comes through if we do it well with our characters uh, this was a great, I think, a great piece of writing. It's lean and mean and unforgettable in the way that Jim Thompson's best work is. And I, I do like when he when he brings it back home to Oklahoma and to Texas and to that era, because I think that's where he really uh, thrives. That's the classic Thompson uh, setting. Um, there was an inter- interesting film adaption. There were several, at least, but I know that one in particular was is considered the the great one for population 1280 it was um done by the french and we know uh, the french have a love for american noir and they put out a film uh, the coup de torchon in 1981 it was directed by bertrand uh, tavernier and it was filmed 
um, not in France, but in uh, desert Senegal. In I think I believe it's in eastern Senegal in, in in West Africa, in a desert setting. So on the on the edge of the Sahel in the Sahara. And I think I think this plot was chosen to capture the sort of desert feel that that um, Thompson captures in his Texas and Oklahoma set stories. And the uh, French expression is actually uh, coup, uh, coup de torchon. Is, it means to wipe clean. So it's it's called blank slate. And um, the film opens. I mean, it's interesting. We're following a like a colonial French uh, officer, and in this context of of, of Africa. And it's set in the 1930s, you know, prior to World War II. And I watched it just recently, and I wanted to see how close it, it, it adhered to the novel. And I would say that ultimately the, the, the main beats are there. We have the, we have, uh, the wife and, that, and the cuckolding. They make it more obvious that Rose's, uh, Rose's mentally ill brother is not actually a brother at all, simply a boyfriend who's been cuckolding his wife and, and scamming him because he's such a sucker. So it paints Nick in a more extremely uh, in, deficient light. Um, but then we also get, you know, we, we get the, um, well, that's the Myra character. We get the Rose character. We get the Amy character. We get the killings of the pimps thrown into the river and all everything else. Uh, the funny thing is I, I watched the films in French. Uh, so I was hoping for English subtitles because I'm, I'm not fluent in French and I got Spanish subtitles and that's the only copy I had. So um, my Spanish isn't good enough. So I, I, I watched the French Spanish version um, and uh, picked up some of the language. But overall, I got the gist. You could, it's a pretty plot driven story. And um, I really I thought it was it was for what I could tell, it was a pretty smart, uh, you know, capture of, of the film. And it did win the the Prix Malise. And I'm sorry, I'm butchering French uh, from the French syndicate of cinema critics, uh, in 1981 is the best French film. So it's well regarded in, in, in France, but also I think it's, it's one of the better adaptations of a, of a crime noir film that I've, that I've seen. And I, and I do recommend it. Hmm. Well, that's good to hear. I, I'm going to, is there a, a version with English subtitles? I would assume there must I'm be. I'm sure, I'm sure there is. I, I got this off of like archive.org. So I was, I was forced to watch whatever it was that somebody posted, uh, it's hard to find. Um, I think sure. you can get some. You can get it on Criterion, but it's not on the Criterion channel. And I was trying to find it on any streaming service, oh. and it was like nowhere. So I think you might have to buy it, or like I said, there's a, a place to find it online. Um, it's been loaded up to archive.org. I don't know if it's legit or not, or if it's legal or not, but it happens to be there. So do what you will. Gotcha. Oh, and also there's a new one. Argue. What I've read is that there's a new version set to come out in 2020. I'm not sure if COVID has slowed down the progress on it, but it's a Greek director named Yorgos uh, Lathimos, and he, uh, he's he been tapped to direct the new uh, adaptation. So uh, there might be one coming down the pipeline. Um, I'd be curious to know how that uh, aligns with, with the book and if it actually comes to pass because we know how it is with adaptions. Some, some of them uh, come, come to pass and some of them just sort of fizzle out and disappear. So we'll see. Well, that would be, yeah, it would be nice. I mean, I can certainly see this or uh, I guess it's been long enough that we could see a new remake of a killer inside me, but uh, either one uh, would be good to see on the screen. Yeah, totally. I also read a couple of, you know, Jim Thompson is known for his, for his novels, but he also wrote semi-autobiographical novels, I guess you'd call them, but they're more like memoir uh, that try to capture his his early days. One of them is called Bad Boy. One of them is called Roughneck. I think Kurt has mentioned these in the past, perhaps in episode one. I, I, I read them both and, you know, they're not my favorite. I think Jim's at his finest when he is delving into straight fiction and trying to capture other characters. When he tries to fictionalize himself, uh, it loses something. I think he might be trying a little too hard. Uh, might be trying to reach an audience that, that isn't exactly the audience that uh, I am. Um, but let me speak briefly about Bad Boy. Uh, it's like tall tales for a mass audience. And it covers, uh, Bad Boy covers his early days as a, as a kid and teenager uh, coming up in Depression era Oklahoma. Uh, I don't care so much for the stories from his very early days, like about his childhood. But I do like the teen accounts of, of things when he's working in a fancy motels and getting into all sorts of mischief and trouble and by trying to sell alcohol on the side and sort of falling into in with the bad crowd a little bit as he tries to uh, scrape scrape by in, in a society where there's not much available to him. I, I thought that part was pretty cool. 
And um, I'd rather that this be marketed as fiction so that he could really turn, you know, dive in and quit trying to adhere to his own like past. But whatever. Uh, some elements were pretty cool. Uh, Roughneck is a little bit later. That's like his adulthood when he's uh, he leaves town and he goes about his business, going to jobs and trying to survive as a as somebody who's trying to be a writer, an emerging writer, but also a young married man with kids and like no money during a depression. He's working oil fields, uh, committing various scams with his various friends. Uh, he becomes the director of the Oklahoma Writing Program, which we've talked about in, in episode one where he was running this program and it was incredibly frustrating for him, but it was one of the only times that he was like a public figure and he was doing good and it was a real radical program and, and really tied to like trying to like capture the radical history of the era and it was all tied to the New Deal and, you know, pretty cool era. And um, I, I didn't love this book, just like with Bad Boy. I think there was, there was some good and some of it just didn't sit right with me. But um, if you are interested in capturing Jim Thompson's highly biased take on his own life before he broke big with his with his noir novels, th these are, you know, nice. It's nice that he has these and that th these are available to us to understand him through his own eyes. So um, I, I'm not sure. I, you read them both, right? Did you feel that they were mixed bags too, Kurt? Yeah, I did read both of them. And I would have to agree with you that um, they're they're kind of a mixed bag. And I mean, I think if you're a really interest, you know, you're really interested in Jim Thompson, they're definitely worth a read to say what he has to, you know, to see what he has to say for himself. But I want to go back to that biography that we Savage read. Savage art. Savage art. Yeah. Biography of Jim Thompson by uh, Robert uh, Polito, yeah. which is still one of the best biographies I have read. Uh, certainly of an author. Yeah. Agreed. Ever. And, uh, that that's if you really want to find out about Jim Thompson, that's the book to read Savage Art. I mean, that was phenomenal, I thought. But yeah, his own. I mean, it's important to read what he says in his own words. But but uh, you are certainly a biased interpreter of your own life. So you certainly get some of that in, in both of the books you mentioned. Yeah, I really think that Roughneck and Bad Boy is is Jim Thompson trying to capture his life through like the prism of his interpretation of Mark Twain or something. I think he's trying to like do like <laughs> yokel yarns. Like it's almost like with like a little gag reel. Like I feel like he's, he's trying to appeal to like, like the masses that, and his books aren't for the masses. His noir is gritty and violent no. and treacherous and, and, and um, transgressive. And he, that is not how he captured his, his life. He was like, a, well, I'm just a young boy trying to get by and look at all the hijinks I get into. And it's like, what? It just reads it, the the tone is off for me, but 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 that being said, Jim Thompson, I mean, he lived the life, you know, like his he's not he's not screwing with you when he says he worked, you know, very difficult jobs. No, I agree. Um, he 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 knows what living poor is. He knows what living rough is. He knows what what this you know what this is all about. And, and, uh, you know, this sort of reminds me of a comment, uh, a, a writer friend of mine made uh, just in passing on a podcast recently about uh, saying something about how too many writers today don't really understand conflict because they haven't really had to deal with a whole lot of it. And that's something we certainly do not see in so many of the writers of this period. And that, you know, whether that is, uh, is the lives that they lived growing up or whether that was their involvement in one of the, uh, military conflicts of, of the period or, you know, what have you. But a lot of these people really lived uh, at least a portion of their life uh, is, is very rough and tumble. And they understood what it was like to, you know, to be in a fist fight or something like that. And they wrote about it. And um, and I think that's why some of this stuff still speaks to us is because these these authors were, you know, writing from a, a place of experience or at least close enough uh, that it was it was believable. I think that might be one of the reasons we we like Jim Thompson so much, not just because of the quality of his work, but also he comes back. He comes from this truly working class, um, you know, background that was hard scrabble, and 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 that he captures in in the stuff that he writes about, and that differed from Dash Hammett and and Ray Chandler and those other those mask writers who were struggling to get by as writers, but some of them weren't exactly. 
uh, coming up from Hard Scrabble lives. They they were especially somebody like Chandler who who lived a pretty peachy middle class existence before he got into writing. Um, so, uh, so something about Thompson's rawness and 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 how his past sort of matches up with the stuff he writes about, uh, lot, like a lot of grit lit, um, you know, is is memorable. Yeah. And uh, it was nice to spend a, a little more time with him. Maybe in another fifty episodes, uh, we'll we'll visit him again. Um, we'll we'll see if we make it that far. <laughs> well, let's hope so. And uh, yeah, let's let's we'll we'll be certainly going going back to Jim. It did feel nice to revisit an author this episode. Um, and that, you know, I, I think that's one of the downsides of doing this show is that so often we do, we find somebody interesting or we find a series that's interesting. And uh, rather than being able to continue on with that series or that author, uh, we're, we're jumping into the next topic. And so, th- you know, that, that made it feel very nice to revisit Jim Thompson and, and something that I, I need to do more frequently. Definitely. And, and we, with our new, with our new setup, we're going to, it frees us up to do things a little bit differently. We're going to have our deep dives like today, but our next episode, episode 51, we're going to do, instead of a five-round bursts of reviews, we're going to do a first 50 reflection where we have five questions for Kurt and, for Kurt and I, and we're going to answer those questions, questions about, you know, what, what books really stood out to us, what authors do we love, what, you know, sort of reflecting on, on our experience with the first 50 episodes of Point Blank. Um, episode 52 is going to be a subject unknown where we talk about spy fiction generally, which allows us to uh, pick and choose a variety of different authors and sort of explore the, um, the genre or the subgenre um, extensively. How do folks reach us, Kurt? The best way to get a hold of us is probably to send us an email at uh, pointblanknoir at gmail.com. Uh, you can always interact with us on Facebook at Point Blank Hardboiled Noir and Detective Fiction. We do have a, a, a list, small listeners group there as well. We have a Goodreads group uh, that you can find with a search there, uh, Point Blank Podcast. Um, and we're kind of trying to revitalize that one. A new listener has kind of taken over the reins uh, of that and uh, find some discussion on there. Yeah, those are pretty much the big ways to get a hold of us. Again, if you have you know specific questions or really want to get to us uh, the quickest, email is probably the best. So uh, we we thank you very much for listening to episode fifty. It feels very good to get here, and we thank all of you who have been along with us for the ride. Um, and next time, episode fifty one, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely grab a beer, and uh, we're gonna enjoy. Um, reflecting on those 50 episodes and we're going to talk some of our, our well best and worst uh, books of, uh, of 50 episodes. So we'll see you totally. next time. I look forward to that. Uh, also, if you have a couple books you want to throw our way uh, every so often, uh, we do have a Patreon account and you can find that uh, on our website. So that being said, uh, have a good, uh, have a good time. We'll see you for episode 51. <laughs> Point Blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders. Mm-hmm.